This is an audio sermon recorded at the Church of Christ at Johnson Mill in Fayetteville, Arkansas. We are Christians seeking to worship God in spirit and in truth according to the New Testament. Come worship with us Sunday mornings at 1030 at 3801 Johnson Mill Boulevard. There's a lot of confusion today in religion, and we've talked about that many times, and there's a lot of false doctrine in the world, and there are a lot of people that uh, hide their, their eyes to that fact, but it's true. There's just a lot of false teaching. And the Bible warns us about false teaching and about false teachers, and I'm going to share about four scriptures with you. If you want to write these down, you may. They're not on your chart, but just as a way of introducing the the thoughts today. Jesus warned us about false teachers in Matthew 7, Matthew 7 and verse 15. Jesus said, Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. Now, if you'll get that picture the Lord's giving, picture a flock of sheep, and then picture picture this wolf coming into the flock, and he's dressed like a sheep. This is how a false teacher is pictured by Christ. Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. And he talks about what a false prophet will do to God's people, just like what a wolf will do to a flock of sheep. He will devour them. He will destroy them. So false teaching is very dangerous, and Jesus said, Beware. He warned us of that. In 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1 to 3, Paul gave this warning. Paul said, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry, and commanding to abstain from meats, which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. So Paul said men would depart from the faith and give heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Devil's doctrine, he said. And so he warned us of that. In 2 Peter, 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 1 and 2, Peter gave a warning about false teachers. Peter said, But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. And many shall follow their pernicious ways, by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. So Peter warned that there would be false teachers among us, just like there were false prophets in the Old Testament. And many false prophets there were back there. John gives this final warning I want to mention in 1 John. 1 John chapter 1, or chapter 4 rather, verse 1. 1 John 4 and 1. John said, Believe not, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. John said many false prophets are gone out into the world. So we shouldn't be surprised at false teachers today because there are a lot of them, and the Bible warns us about it. And notice I've, I read there four warnings, one from Jesus, one from Paul, one from Peter, one from John. I wanted to give us four different witnesses that have all warned of the same thing. So the Bible abounds with such warnings, and you and I, of course, need to have a knowledge of God's Word where we'll know what's true and what's false, and we'll be able to make that determination. One of the uh, great things that is is uh, taught today that uh, is confusing to a lot of people is the subject of baptism. And when that subject comes up, a lot of people use the, the thief on the cross, the story of the thief on the cross, to try to say that we don't need to be baptized. And when you, when you read a passage like was read in the opening Scripture by Chris this morning, Mark 16, 16, where Jesus said, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, a lot of people will say, Well, the thief on the cross wasn't saved. And they'll run back to the thief and bring up uh, his conversion story and try to get around the commandment to be baptized. And that's dealing deceitfully with God's Word. So I want to study that thief on the cross with you this morning and do a thorough study on him so that we'll understand how this man was saved and some things about it. I want you to look on your charts now on the back side. Matthew 27, Matthew 27, and we'll stay on this chart now from here on. And verse 38 to 44. Matthew 27, 38 to 44. Matthew says, Then were there two thieves crucified with him, one on the right hand and another on the left. 
And they that passed by reviled him, wagging their heads and saying, Thou that destroyest the temple and buildest it in three days, save thyself. If thou be the Son of God, come down from the cross. Likewise also the chief priest, mocking him with the scribes and elders, said, He saved others, himself he cannot save. If he be the King of Israel, let him now come down from the cross, and we will believe him. He trusted in God, let him deliver him now if he will have him. For he said, I am the Son of God. The thieves also which were crucified with him cast the same in his teeth. Picture this scene with me. Three crosses on a lonely hill outside Jerusalem. On the middle cross, the Son of God, sinless, innocent, and on each side of Jesus was a thief. And down below at the foot of the cross there was a mob. They were surging back and forth and looking up at Jesus. And as He suffered and died, they were taunting Him. And they said, Thou that destroyest the temple and buildest it in three days, save yourself. If you're the Son of God, come down from the cross. We'll believe you. Why, He trusted in God. Let Him deliver Him now if He will have Him. For He said, I'm the Son of God. And then notice verse 44. The Bible says that the thieves also which were crucified with Him cast the same in His teeth. Not only was this crowd reviling Jesus, but each thief on each side of Him was also taunting Him and telling Him to come down from the cross if He's the Son of God and deliver them. See, The thieves also which were crucified with Him cast the same in His teeth. Both thieves were mocking Jesus when they were first hanged on the cross. Now Luke gives a record of this in Luke 23. Read here with me. Luke 23 and verse 39 to 43. <clears throat> and let's get Luke's record. Luke says, And one of the male factors which were hanged railed on him, saying, If thou be Christ, save thyself and us. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, Dost not thou fear God, seeing thou art in the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deed. But this man had done nothing amiss. And he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. Here's the old thief on the cross. And notice now that in the midst of all this, <clears throat> all this reviling and persecuting and talk, one of these thieves has grown utterly and strangely silent. Both of them were mocking Jesus when they were first put on the cross, but now one of them actually not only becomes silent in his reviling of Christ, but he starts preaching to the other thief. And he uses his bloody wooden cross as a pulpit. <clears throat> and he says to the other thief, Does not thou fear God? In other words, he's telling this other thief, Look, we're dying here. Eternal things are what matter now. This is what really matters most. It's time you started fearing God. Dost thou not fear God, seeing thou art in the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deed. But this man hath done nothing amiss. So he's telling this other thief, you need to start fearing God. You and I are dying. We have sinned, and sin brings ruin, and we're getting exactly what we deserve. But this man here in the middle has done nothing wrong. He recognized the innocency of Jesus, see, and he rebuked this other thief. Evidently, the Lord's words and actions have made a big impact upon this thief. He's watched Jesus now for several hours on that cross. Remember, they were put on the cross there. The Lord was about 9 o'clock in the morning, and Jesus died about 3 that afternoon. At noonday, the sun was darkened. And that thief would have known, noticed all of the darkness around about all of them because it just became totally black. The sun for three hours wouldn't even shine on this scene. And that's had an impact upon this thief. And then there's the words and actions of Jesus on the cross because <clears throat> when His enemies taunted Him and reviled Him here, Jesus never reviled back. He never threatened them. He never said, I'm going to get you guys one day. One day you're going to pay for this. The Lord never threatened His enemies at all. The Bible says of Jesus in 1 Peter that when he was, he was reviled, He reviled not again. When He suffered, He threatened not, but committed Himself to Him that judgeth righteously. 
So Jesus never threatened His enemies. Instead, you know what the first words of Jesus were on the cross? They were spoken to His Father, not to His enemies. He never threatened the enemies. He went first of all to His Father, and He said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what to do. He, he prayed for the very people that were killing Him. And this has had an impact upon this thief. This has, this has made a change come over him. Now he sees in Jesus, not a common criminal like he and the other thief are, but he sees something here. He sees this is the King of Israel. This is the Son of God. This is the Messiah. This man is innocent. And he's completely changed. And he starts preaching to the other thief. See, Dost not thou fear God, seeing thou art in the same condemnation, and we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deed, but this man had done nothing amiss. And then I want you to notice his words to Jesus here. He said to Christ, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee today, thou shalt be with me in paradise. And a lot of people say, Well, this thief here was just grasping at straws. I mean, he's dying and he's just taking the last thing he can get a hold of. And but I'm going to tell you this morning, the thief had a little bit more going for him than this. This is a man that's had a change come over him. He has repented. He has faith now in Jesus. And I want you to notice the words that he spoke to Christ. He said to Jesus, Lord, I want you to notice those words, Lord, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. The word Lord means ruler. Now listen, it was easy for people to call Jesus Lord when He came riding into Jerusalem on a donkey, and they were waving palm branches and crying, Hosanna to the Son of David. And people got caught up in that mob there in the emotion of it and could call Jesus Lord. But how many people this day, how many people the day Christ died called Him Lord? The word Lord means ruler, and Jesus is dying. It doesn't look like He rules anything. He is being ruled, isn't He? He's being taken to this place and crucified and put to death. It doesn't look like He controls anything. And yet the thief called Him Lord when nobody else that day did. I want you to notice that about the thief. He wasn't ashamed to call Jesus Lord. Then he said to Him, Lord, remember me when Thou comest into Thy kingdom. This thief believed in the kingdom. How many people that day believed that Jesus would one day have a kingdom? that He would rule a kingdom. Well, He did. This thief believed in it. Remember me when you come into your kingdom, see. That's pretty good faith. Because Jesus doesn't look like He's going to rule anything. He doesn't look like He's going to have a kingdom. He is a dying man. He is an utterly defeated man, it looks like. And yet the thief believed in the kingdom of the Lord when nobody else that day did, see. And let me show you something else. He said, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. He didn't say if you come into it. Remember me when you come into your kingdom. And that implies that he believed in the resurrection of Jesus because Jesus has died. And dead men don't come into a kingdom. What I'm telling you is the thief believed in the resurrection of Jesus before it ever happened. Remember me when you come into your kingdom. He was sure even though Jesus was dying, that one day the Lord would come into a kingdom. You see, He believed in the resurrection of Christ before it ever happened. None of the apostles that day believed in the resurrection. And you remember when the Lord appeared to the twelve later after He rose from the dead? Thomas wasn't there. And when the other disciples told Thomas that Jesus is risen from the dead, He's appeared to us, we've seen Him. Thomas said, I will not believe unless I can touch the prints of the nails in His hand and thrust my hand into His side, I will not believe. And Thomas wouldn't even believe after he had testimony from other people. Yet the thief believed in the resurrection before it ever occurred, and he believed it that day. This is a pretty incredible man right here, and he's made quite a change on the cross. And the Lord said to this man, Verily I say unto thee today, shalt thou be with me in paradise. Jesus said today, the sufferings will all be over, and you're going to end up with me in paradise. What great news to a thief. 
And what a day in the life of this thief. I want you to think about his life that day. That thief that morning woke up in prison. Woke up in prison, the thief. At noonday, he's on a cross preaching to the other thief. That evening, he's in paradise with the Lord. That's, that's quite a day, isn't it? Woke up in prison on a cross at noon, and that evening in paradise with Jesus. Quite a day. Jesus told him, today you'll be with me in paradise. Somebody says to me, well, Pat, do you think Jesus saved this man? I sure do. I sure do. I'm going to tell you what, if I were dying, I'd give everything I've got right now. My house, my car, any money I have, anything I've got. I'd give everything I have right now to have Jesus say to me, Pat, today you'll be with me in paradise. Because that means I'd have everlasting life. And I'd trade everything I've got for that. Yes, I believe the Lord saved him. Somebody says, well, <clears throat> that's what I thought. That just means now that baptism is not essential to salvation because the thief wasn't baptized. You see, that's really what people want to do when they talk about the thief. They're trying to get around baptism. And so when you mention baptism, they run back to the thief and they say, well, the Lord forgave him and this man wasn't baptized. Well, first of all, we don't know whether the thief was baptized or not, number one. Read there with me Matthew 3, verse 5 and 6. Matthew 3, verse 5 and 6. John the Baptist had come, and the Bible says of John, Then went out to him, Jerusalem, and all Judea, and all the region round about Jordan, and were baptized of him in Jordan, confessing their sins. Was the thief among this number? I don't know. But there went out Jerusalem, all Judea, and all the region round about Jordan went out to John, and were baptized of him there in Jordan, confessing their sins. Was the thief in that number? I don't know. He probably wasn't. But the point is, we don't know one way or another whether the thief was baptized. And I'm going to tell you this morning, it doesn't make any difference. And here's why. This thief lived and died before Jesus ever gave the command to be baptized, before he ever gave the Great Commission. He died before the Great Commission was spoken, where Jesus said, Go baptize all nations in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. That command wasn't even given yet. So he could not obey something that Jesus hadn't even spoken yet. So. And yet people want to go back before the Lord spoke those words and talk about the thief. I've told you guys, you folks, several times uh, about a verse, Hebrews 9, Hebrews 9, verse 15 to 17. And I've mentioned these three verses, and it's my firm belief that we cannot understand the Bible unless we understand these three verses. We'll never understand the Bible. When I first got a grasp of these three verses right here, the Bible finally started making sense to me. It's Hebrews 9, verse 15 to 17, and the writer's talking about Jesus. Let's read it for a minute. The Bible says, and for this cause, He, Jesus, is the mediator of the New Testament that by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. For where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. For a testament is a force after men are dead, otherwise it is of no strength at all while the testator liveth. So the writer here is talking about wills and testaments, and you and I know a little bit about these. What is a will in a testament? If I were to give you a simple definition, it would be this. A will is an instrument of writing containing the will of a person concerning the division of their estate among their heirs after their death. Let me say that again. A will is an instrument of writing containing the will of a person concerning the division of their estate among their heirs after their death. So we're familiar with wills and testaments. People will write out their last will and testament, what they're going to bequeath or leave to others, and they'll name those people in their will. And so we're familiar with that. Now when does a will come into effect? The Bible here says after the death of the testator. A will never comes into effect while the person who made that will is alive, because that person still got free will, and they might change that will. They might change what's in it, 
They might change the name of the heirs. They can alter that while they're living in any way they want to. But when we make that will out and we die, and the will comes into effect, then that will's unchangeable. And this thief died before Jesus' will came into effect because Jesus is still alive and He's on earth. And the Lord often forgave people while He was here on earth. He did that many, many times. He had the power on earth to forgive people. You see, as long as He was alive, He could do as He wished. But when He died and His will came into effect, if there were any conditions in that will, then they were unchangeable and they are what applied. Let me illustrate what I'm trying to tell you today. And I want you to use your imagination very vividly. Think of me today as a rich man, okay? That'll take some imagination. I'm a very wealthy man, and let's say Jeb comes to me, and, and we've been friends, and he's needing some help. He says, Pat, I, I need some help right now. I'm, I'm kind of down, and I need a little bit of money. And so I just pull some money out of my pocket because he's asked me. Now, this is a $50 bill, but I want you to think of it as, a, let's say it's 500 and he's asked me for $500, and I just give him $500. Can I do that? I can do that because when I'm alive, I can do what I want to with my money. Now let's suppose that I make out a will, and I, I put in that will, I offer $500 to every one of you, every one of you, on the condition that you're baptized. You've got to be baptized. And when I'm dead, that will comes into effect, and 500 is offered to you. And so, on the condition of baptism. Let's say that I die and my will comes into effect, and uh, Dustin learns about my offer here, and uh, he decides, I'd like to have that $500 Pat's offer. So he goes to the executors, and he says to them, understand that, uh, that Pat's offering $500 to everybody. And they said, well, yes, he is, Dustin. Well, he says, I want it. And they said, well, that's fine. You can sure have that money, Dustin, but you're going to have to be baptized because he says that in his will here that you've got to be baptized in order to get the 500. Suppose Dustin says, well, I don't want to be baptized because I remember, I remember on February the 16th in 2020, I, I saw Pat hand $500 to Jeb, and Jeb didn't have to be baptized. And I don't either. Since Jeb didn't have to be, I don't have to be either. You and I know what the executors are going to tell Dustin, don't we? They're going to tell him, Dustin, look, when Pat was alive, he could do what he wanted to with his money. But now that he's dead and his will's come into effect, and he's placed the condition of baptism in that will, you're going to have to be baptized. And you'll never get the 500 without it. You see, my will has become unchangeable, see? Unchangeable. While I was alive, I could do what I wanted. But when a person dies and their will comes into effect, then that will is what takes over and it's unchangeable. It cannot be altered at all. See? Just the same principle applies to Jesus. While Jesus was here on earth, He could forgive anybody He wanted to of His own will. But when He died and His will came into effect, then whatever conditions are in His will are going to have to be met. They can't be changed. See, That's the same principle. I'm going to give you four examples this morning. We've already read one. Four examples of where Jesus forgave people and uh, show you that the Lord had power on earth to forgive. The first one is in Luke 5. Let's just read these off the back side. Luke 5, verse 18 through 26. <coughs> Luke 5, 18 to 26. Luke says, Behold, men brought into bed a man which was taken with a palsy. That palsy means he was paralyzed. He's on a bed paralyzed. <clears throat> they sought means to bring him in and to lay him before him. And when they could not find by what way they might bring him in because of the multitude, they went upon the housetop and let him down through the tiling with his couch into the midst before Jesus. And when he saw their faith, he said unto him, Man, thy sins are forgiven thee. And the scribes and the Pharisees began to reason, saying, who is this which speaketh blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? But when Jesus perceived their thoughts, He answering said unto them, What reason ye in your hearts? Whether is easier to say, Thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, Rise up and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man hath power upon earth to forgive sins, 
He said unto the sick of the palsy, I say unto thee, Arise, take up thy couch, and go into thine house. And immediately he rose up before them, and took up that whereon he lay, and departed to his own house, glorifying God. And they were all amazed, and they glorified God, and were filled with fear, saying, We have seen strange things today. Now let's picture this. Jesus is in a house teaching. And there's a paralyzed man on a bed, and men are carrying him around, and they're taking him taking him to the house where Jesus is. The problem is the doors are jammed and the windows are jammed and they can't get the man inside. They know Jesus can heal him, but they can't get him inside where the Lord is. Back in the Bible times there, houses had outside stairways and the rooftops were flat and that was their patio. That's where they lounged and spent a lot of time up on the roof. And so they just climb up on the roof, carry this man bed and all up on top of the house and they tear the tiling back over the room where Jesus is, like a huge hole, and just let the whole bed down into the room where Christ is. When Jesus saw their faith, He looked at that man and said, Man, thy sins are forgiven thee. Now let's notice that just a minute. Jesus forgave this man right there. And folks, the only person that you and I can forgive is somebody that sinned against us. Has Jesus ever met this man before? So far as we know, He's never met him. So what is He doing forgiving this man when the man obviously has never met Christ? How did He sin against Jesus? Only if Jesus were God, and then all sins are against Him. And Jesus is God, of course, and that's what He was trying to teach. Since He's God, this man's sins were against Jesus, and Jesus had the power to forgive him. So Jesus asked a question that I want to ask of you. He asked of His enemies. These enemies were standing there and they began to murmur. They said, this man's blaspheming here. This Jesus committing blasphemy. He's acting like He's God. Who can forgive sins but God alone? And what His enemies didn't know is that Jesus is God. See? So Jesus asked them a question. Here's the question. I'm going to ask it of you. Which is easier? to say to a crippled man, or to a sinner rather, Thy sins be forgiven, or to say to a crippled man, Rise up and walk. Which one of those is easier? That's what He asked them. What's easier to do, forgive sins or heal a cripple? The answer is only God can do either one. So Jesus said, So you'll know that I've got power on earth to forgive sins. He said to the sick of the palsy, I say unto thee, Arise, Take up your couch and go to your house. And the man just rose up immediately, picked up his bed, and walked off glorifying God. And the audience was filled with fear, and they glorified God. And they said, We've seen strange things today. Indeed, they had. They had. What Jesus demonstrated there by forgiving the man was that he had also power to heal him. Or demonstrating that he had power to heal him, he showed that he'd already forgiven him because only God can forgive and only God can heal. Jesus had power on earth. He said, So you'll know that the Son of Man hath power upon earth to forgive sins. He said to the sick of the palsy, I say unto thee, Arise, take up thy couch, and go into thine house. And that's exactly what the man did. Jesus forgave sins often. He could do that while He was here on earth. Let's read another example in Luke 7. Luke 7, verse 36 to 50. <clears throat> this is the penitent woman that he forgave. Luke says, One of the Pharisees desired him that he would eat with him. And he went into the Pharisee's house and sat down to meet. And behold, a woman in the city, which was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat at meat in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster box of ointment, and stood at his feet behind him weeping, and began to wash his feet with tears, and did wipe them with the hairs of her head, and kissed his feet, and anointed them with the ointment. Now when the Pharisee which had bidden him saw it, he spake within himself, saying, This man, if he were a prophet, would have known who and what manner of woman this is that toucheth him, for she is a sinner. And Jesus answering said unto him, Simon, I have somewhat to say unto thee. And he saith, Master, say on. There was a certain creditor which had two debtors, the one owed five hundred pence, and the other fifty. And when they had nothing to pay, he frankly forgave them both. 
Tell me therefore which of them will love him most? Simon answered and said, I suppose that he to whom he forgave most. And he said, Thou hast rightly judged. And he turned to the woman and said unto Simon, Seest thou this woman? I entered into thine house, thou gavest me no water for my feet. But she hath washed my feet with tears, and wiped them with the hairs of her head. Thou gavest me no kiss. But this woman since the time I came in hath not ceased to kiss my feet. My head with oil thou didst not anoint. But this woman hath anointed my feet with ointment. Wherefore I say unto thee, Her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. For to whom little is forgiven, the same loveth little. And he said unto her, Thy sins are forgiven. And they that sat at meat with him began to say within themselves, Who is this that forgiveth sins also? And he said to the woman, Thy faith has saved thee, go in peace. Jesus here has had an invitation to dine at a Pharisee's house. He accepted that invitation. They sat down to eat, and here comes a woman in. She's a sinner. She may have been a prostitute there in the city. She's been a great sinner. But she believes in Jesus. She knows who He is. And she is repentant of her sins, and she's crying tears as big as biscuits, evidently. She stood behind Jesus weeping, and there was so much water coming out of her eyes, so many heavy tears flowing, that landing on Jesus' feet, she had enough water there just from her tears to wash His feet. She got down, took her beautiful hair, and used it as a washcloth and began to wash Jesus' feet. She kissed His feet. She anointed His feet with ointment. She was so sorry for her sins. And Jesus saw her repentance and He saw her faith and the Lord had compassion because He had power on earth to forgive sins. And He said to that woman, Your sins are forgiven you. Now the Pharisee that He was dining with didn't like that. He thought that was blasphemous, that Jesus had no right to forgive this woman. And uh, she was such a sinner, he said, if you were a prophet, he was thinking to himself, if, if you're, Jesus, if you're a prophet, you'd know who and what manner of this woman is that touches you, for she's a sinner. In other words, if you were really a man of God, you wouldn't let this woman touch you. You wouldn't let her anywhere near you. She is such a horrible person, so wicked. And Jesus said, Simon, I've got something to say to you. But he said, Say on. Jesus said a man had two, two creditors, two debtors. One owed him 500 pence and the other owed him 50. And he, he forgave them both because they couldn't pay. Which one's going to love him most? And Simon said, It'll be the one you for, that he forgave the most. And he said, You've judged right. This woman, you see, had a lot of sins. Maybe Simon didn't have so many. But her sins, which are many, were forgiven, and she loved much, see. Jesus said, To whom little is forgiven, the same loveth little. And He forgave this woman. He had power on earth to do that, see. And He scolded the Pharisee. He said, Look, I came in and you didn't give me any water for my feet. But she's washed my feet with tears and wiped them with the hairs of her head. My head with oil you didn't even anoint, but she's anointed my feet with this ointment. When I came in, Simon, you didn't give me a kiss. You didn't greet me. She has not ceased to kiss my feet since I walked in. And Jesus, having power on earth, forgave that woman of her sins right there. He could do that. Let's read one more. Luke 19. Luke 19, verse 1 to 10. This is Zacchaeus. He was a little bitty short fellow. And Jesus was passing through Jericho where he lived. The Bible says Jesus entered and passed through Jericho, and there was a, a man named Zacchaeus, which was chief among the publicans, and he was rich. And he sought to Jesus, see Jesus, who he was, and could not for the press, because he was little of stature. And he ran before and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him, and said unto him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down. For today I must abide at thy house. And he made haste and came down and received him joyfully. And when they saw it, they all murmured, saying that he was gone to be guest with a man that is a sinner. And Zacchaeus stood and said unto the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. 
If I've taken anything from any man by false accusation, I restore him fourfold. And Jesus said unto him, This day is salvation come to this house, for as much as he also is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. So Jesus now is passing through Jericho, and there's a great multitude lining the streets. He's got a certain route that he will pass down through that city. And there's a little bitty man there, a publican. He's an old tax collector. He's a sinner. And his name is Zacchaeus. And he wants to see Jesus. He's heard about Jesus. The problem is he can't see over the other people. So he runs ahead down the route where Jesus is going and climbs up in a sycamore tree where he can see the Lord when he passes under. But when Jesus came to that place, he saw Zacchaeus. And he hollered at him, called him by name, because the Lord knows everything about us. He called him by name, and he said, Make haste, come down. Today I'm going to your house. I'm going to bind at your house. Zacchaeus, you're going to feed me today. I'm going to come over. The Bible says he came down. He made haste and came down, and he received Jesus joyfully. And look what he said to Christ. You can see his repentance. He said, Lord, I'm going to give half my goods to the poor. How many of you would do that today? Give half of what you got to the poor. I don't hear anybody today saying, I want to be saved like Zacchaeus. See, Half my goods, Lord, I give to the poor. If I've defrauded any man, I'm going to restore him four times over, fourfold for what I've done. Jesus said, Today is salvation come to this house. For as much as he also is a son of Abraham, for the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. And Jesus forgave this man. Now look at your chart there on the left side. Christ forgave men of sins here on earth. Four examples. These are all from the Gospel of Luke, incidentally. Luke recorded these. The palsied man in Luke 5. The penitent woman in Luke 7. The publican Zacchaeus in Luke 19 and the thief on the cross in Luke 23. Jesus had power on earth to forgive sins, and He often did that, see. And people read examples like the thief, and they say, well, I want to be saved like the thief. I don't have to be baptized because the thief wasn't. I never hear them talk about these other three, incidentally. I never hear people say, I want to be saved like the penitent woman, or I want to be saved like Zacchaeus, or I want to be saved like the palsied man. They recognized that the Lord was here on earth. These were special circumstances. He saw these people personally while He was here before His death. And He had power on earth to forgive, and He often did that. And so here's four examples we've read. Now remember our scripture about wills and testaments. That when the Lord died, His will and testament came into effect. And so after Jesus' death, whatever conditions that He offers forgiveness upon are unchangeable. And all we have to do is go to the Great Commission. If you'll look on the right side, you'll see where it says conditions of salvation in the Great Commission. The Great Commission is given three times in the New Testament after the death of Jesus. Matthew records it, Mark records it, and Luke records it. A commission means authority to act for somebody else, authority to act in their place. When Jesus sent the apostles out, He commissioned them. That is, He gave them authority to act for, in behalf of, or in place of Himself. And we call this the Great Commission because it's great in scope. It includes all nations. See, And let's read the three records of the Great Commission. First from Matthew, Matthew 28 there on the back, verse 18 to 20. Here's what Matthew says in the Great Commission. Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. So Jesus said, You go teach all nations. And then you baptize those people that you've been taught. You baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. So he gave baptism as a commission. 
as a, as a condition. Now let's get Mark's record, Mark 16, verse 15 and 16. Brother Chris read that this morning in our reading. This is Jesus speaking, and He said unto them, Go ye into all the world, and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. So Jesus named belief and baptism here. He that believeth and is baptized. I'll ask you a question. Can a person be saved today without believing? And you say, well, no. No, Jesus said you've got to believe. Jesus also said you've got to be baptized. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. So He named there belief and baptism. Now Luke gives a record in Luke 24. Let's get Luke's record of the Great Commission. Luke 24, verse 45 to 47, Luke says this, Then opened He their understanding, that they might understand the Scriptures, and said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer, and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in His name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. Now notice, He says repentance is to be preached. To repent means to change your mind. It means to turn from what's wrong to what's right. When a person repents, they resolve they resolve to turn from what's, what, what they've been doing wrong and start doing right. It's a change of mind that results in a change of life. That's all repentance is. And repentance is done quickly. The thief did it there on the cross, didn't he? He repented, see. And he asked the Lord to forgive him. As soon as a person resolves to, to quit the life of sin and to turn to God, and they're sorry for those sins, then they've repented, they've changed their mind, and that will result in a change of life. They'll walk in a different direction, and that's what repentance is. So he's named, he's named these three conditions. Notice, belief, repentance, and baptism. Now that's in the will that Jesus gave. And when the Lord died, these three conditions came into effect. Kind of like me with my money. I could hand Jeb money while I'm alive and here on earth, But if I make a will out and put the condition of baptism in it, Dustin's going to have to be baptized, see, because my will's unchangeable. What I want to do now as we close our study this morning is give you one more example of a person being saved, and this time it's after the death of Jesus when His wills come into effect. And the example I want to look at is the Apostle Paul, Saul of Tarsus, because he actually saw Jesus after His death. He saw Him just like the palsied man and the penitent woman and Zacchaeus and the thief. And I want to study with you how Saul was forgiven of his sins after the Lord's will came into effect. So we turn there and read from Acts 9. Luke gives this record. Luke wrote the book of Acts. And here's what he says now about the conversion of Saul of Tarsus. Incidentally, Saul was a Jew. Paul. He's the Apostle Paul. We call him Saul or Paul. And uh, he didn't believe in Jesus. He didn't believe Jesus had risen from the dead, and he thought any Jew that believed that ought to be put to death, ought to be punished. And he tore the church up in Jerusalem and scattered the disciples. But he wasn't satisfied there. He learned that 146 miles to the northeast up in Syria, Damascus, Jews up there were converting over to Jesus in those synagogues. So he got the high priest at Jerusalem to write letters to the men that ruled those synagogues up in Damascus that if there were any Jews up there, men or women, that were converting over to Christ, Paul could bind them and bring them back down to Jerusalem to be punished. It's 146 miles, folks, and he don't have a Chevrolet or a Ford. He doesn't care. He's a madman. He thinks he's doing God's service. He's religiously wrong. He's blinded, see. And so he starts on that journey, and he's going to get near the city here and see Jesus. Let's read about it now. Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest and desired of him letters to Damascus to the synagogues, that if he found any of this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus. And suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven. And he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, 
Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And he trembling and astonished said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. And the men which journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no man. And Saul rose from the earth, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no man. But they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. Let me stop there at the end of verse 8. Don't want to read too much where we forget what's happened. Okay? Saul gets near the city of Damascus. All of a sudden there's a bright light shines about him. It's the glory of Jesus, see. And he fell to the earth and he heard this voice speaking from heaven. Saul! Saul! What would you do if you heard that? What if he called your name outside Springdale? Just hollered at you in a blinding light. Scared Paul to death. Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? Now Paul knew it was the Lord speaking, but he didn't know Jesus was Lord. So he said, Who art thou? Who am I persecuting? Who art thou, Lord? He said, I'm Jesus. I'm Jesus of Nazareth. Now you see, he believes in Jesus. He sees him. He is talking with him, and the Lord's talking to him. And so he's, he's blinded by that light, and he said, Well, Lord, what will you have me to do? Now Jesus could have said to him right here, Thy sins be forgiven thee, but he didn't. He told the thief, Today you'll be with me in paradise. He told the palsied man, Thy sins are forgiven. He told Zacchaeus, This day is salvation come to this house. He told the thief, Today you'll be with me in paradise. Why didn't, when he saw Paul, why didn't he tell him, your sins are forgiven because His wills come into effect. See? And there's conditions in that will. So what did He do? What did He tell Paul to do? He said, You arise and you go into the city and there it will be told you what you must do. Jesus never told him anything except go into the city. And the Lord there obligated Himself at that point to get somebody to go to Paul to tell him what to do. He said, there it will be told you. So the Lord promised him that. The Lord never told him anything, just go to the city. There it will be told you. So he rose from the earth, and when his eyes were open, he saw no man. And, and uh, he said, they that were with him led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. Now look at verse 9. Look what happened when he got into the city. He was three days without sight. <clears throat> neither did eat nor drink. The Lord let him sweat it out a little bit, didn't He? He didn't send him relief immediately. He is three days without sight, and neither did eat or drink. Now ask yourself a question. Why is he fasting for three days? For three days he won't eat or drink. If he's a saved man, he's the most miserable saved man we read about in the Bible. But you see, he's fasting for three days and won't eat or drink because he's repenting. He's so sorry for his sins. And nobody's come to give him relief. The Lord said, Arise, go into the city, and there it'll be told you what you must do, but nobody's come yet. So he continues to fast, see. That's all he can do. So he was three days without sight, neither did he eat or drink. Verse 10, There was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And to him said the Lord in a vision, Ananias, he said, Behold, I am here, Lord. The Lord said unto him, Arise, go into the street which is called Straight, and inquire in the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he prayeth, and hath seen in a vision a man named Ananias coming in, and putting his hand on him that he might receive his sight. Now Jesus makes a selection. He's told Saul, It will be told you what you must do. And he picks out a guy named Ananias. And he gives him a vision. Ananias, he said, I'm here. He said, I want you to go down on Straight Street and inquire in the house down there of a fellow named Judas because there's a man there named Saul of Tarsus and he's praying. Now listen, if we're saved by the sinner's prayer today, this man would be saved. Saul's been praying three days. He, Ananias is told, Behold, he prayeth. 
He has seen Jesus and talked to Him, so we know He believes. He has fasted three days, so we know He's repented. So He believes and repents. That's two of the conditions. He's never been baptized yet. He, uh, he's, had, uh, he's, he's been praying now for three days. You and I would have been praying too, wouldn't we? But you see, the Lord didn't promise to give him, forgive him through prayer. He's been praying. And now we read there that he's had a vision. A man named Ananias coming in, putting his hands on him that he might receive his sight. Now let's get this in our minds right now, what's happened to Paul. He has seen Jesus. He's talked to the Lord. The Lord's talked to him. He has fasted three days. We know he's repented. He has been praying three days. And he's had a vision. You could tell that to most people today and they'd say, well, that's a saved man right there. But he wasn't saved. Because nobody's told him what to do. And Jesus said, you go into the city and there it'll be told you what you must do. Now the Lord sent Ananias to recover his sight. And let's turn to chapter 22. Look down here at Acts 22, verse 12, and let Paul tell us now. Let him finish this story, starting in Acts 9, and tell us his own words about Ananias and what happened. Verse 12, Paul said, One Ananias, a devout man according to the law, having a good report of all the Jews which dwelt there, came unto me, and stood, and said unto me, Brother Saul, receive thy sight. And the same hour I looked up upon him. And he said, The God of our fathers have chosen thee, that thou shouldest know his will, and see that just one, and shouldest hear the voice of his mouth. For thou shalt be his witness unto all men of what thou hast seen and heard. And now why tarriest thou? Arise, and be baptized, and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. What did Ananias tell him to do? He already believed in Jesus because he'd seen him and talked to him. He already met the condition of repentance because he fasted three days. Ananias told him this last step. He is to arise and be baptized and wash away his sins. Do you see that he already had his sins? He still had his sins. He had not been forgiven. Now when these others on that we read about here from the palsied man to the thief, when they had seen Jesus, he forgave them face to face. But when Saul saw him, it was after the will came into effect. And Jesus wouldn't say to Paul, your sins are forgiven, because now the wills come in. And that will has three conditions, belief, repentance, and baptism. And Saul is going to have to comply with the will. And what I'm telling all of us today is this, even if Jesus appeared in our midst today, He's not going to say, Thy sins be forgiven. We're going to have to arise and be baptized because the will's in effect and that will's unchangeable. And we're going to have to comply with it just like Saul of Tarsus. See? Just like the illustration with my money. When I could give Jeb money because I'm here on earth and I can I have power to do what I want, but when I die and make a will and require baptism, Dustin's going to have to be baptized. These people that Jesus forgave, He forgave them because He was here on earth. But after He died and His will came into effect, and He had given the condition of baptism, Saul had to arise and be baptized and wash away his sins. And Saul of Tarsus, whom we know as Paul, wrote most of our New Testament books. And this is how he was saved. See. He wrote Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, 1st and 2nd Timothy, Titus, Philemon, Hebrews, all written by Paul, and yet this is the simple story of his conversion. And if you and I want to be saved today, we can't be saved like the thief. And when you bring up baptism, everybody runs back and says, well, the thief wouldn't baptize. Well, the thief may not have been, but the Great Commission wasn't given, and now it is. And Saul was under it, and you and I are under it, and we're going to have to comply with the conditions in that will to be forgiven. See? And that's the simple truth about salvation and about the thief. And I hope it's been understandable for us today. We always have an invitation every time we meet. We don't force people to come forward. We invite them if they want to. If they need salvation, if they need prayer, if there's something we can do, 
we invite you to come forward while we rise to sing this song. Just have a seat at the front if we can help you in any way as we stand and sing. We hope you enjoyed this teaching from God's Word. To receive new sermons each week, subscribe on Google Play Music, iTunes, Spotify, and like us on Facebook. Thanks for listening, and God bless.